uh, uh, we're going to talk about uh, class actions now. Um, I, you know, I gave that short intro about Mike. I'll tell you, Mike has um, uh, uh, just done amazing work with class actions in a variety of circumstances. Um, I've done class actions too, but he's wildly more successful at it than I am, so I figured he he should talk to you about this. Michael. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, again, I uh, want to just give you just a little bit more about my background. I, when I started out, uh, well, I was a defense guy for three years, and I did government contract litigation, which is really obscure. It's even more arcane than law itself, but it's really obscure. So then I switched over, and when I was first... Uh, hired as a plaintiff's lawyer. It was in a firm called Cohen, Milstein, Hausfeld, and Tolts in Washington, D.C. And their main, uh, well, they did all manner of class actions at the time. They were involved in the Exxon Valdez case and all that litigation. I came in working with a guy named Steve Toll, and he was doing securities cases. But I very quickly became involved in antitrust cases. Where's our antitrust guy? He's not here. Uh, some antitrust cases with Jerry Cohen, who helped write some of the antitrust rules that we deal with today. So I did some of those cases. And then I quickly got involved in all manner of types of class actions. So consumer fraud, civil rights, environmental. Um, and, and what I want to do today is kind of take you through, you've, you've got it in the outline. I'm actually going to give you a little bit more expanded outline, which Casey's copying. But I just want to take you through really an overview of cradle to grave, how do they start and how do they end and what's in between? And there's a lot of, you know, each one of these points I'm hitting on, you could really spend a whole day on just one of those points. So I'm going to necessarily be a little bit overview on some of this stuff. Again, if you have questions or you're dealing with an issue and you're not quite sure what I just said, you know, raise your hand. We'll try to try to explain it and hash it out. So a little bit of history. My dad, I'm the son of two public school teachers. Mom was phys ed, dad was uh, history. And so I start with the history. Um, when I started as an attorney, as a, uh, as a class action guy, I said I started with the securities area. And at that time, in the mid-90s, uh, you'll remember that uh, Bill Clinton was our president. But in the 94 elections, uh, the midterms, right, it was the first time anybody ever in my experience, sort of cared about what's the midterm mean. And the, and the Congress flipped and was Republican. It was the Gingrich Congress, right? America. Right. Contract with America. Exactly right. I said contract with America. Oh. oh, yes, yes, yes. Good, solid point. And my dad would appreciate that as a lifelong Democrat. Um, so... At that time, and you may or may not remember it, but this, this, this whole concept of securities class actions are really bad, they're a pox on our, our, our body politic, and we have to get rid of them. So what happened was they passed the 1995 Private Securities Litigation Reform Act, known as the PSLRA, and it basically it was aimed at a firm that I would eventually join. <laughs> Okay, I said it. Um, the firm that I joined in 97 was was a firm called Milberg, Weiss, Burchett, Heinz, and Lerac, and they were, and still are to this day even, or the offshoots of that firm, are one of the biggest players in the, in the firms that bring these types of cases. And these are securities fraud cases. It's a rule out there. These, these, the laws were passed after the Depression, 33-34 Act. Right, and they and they basically were laws that were meant to prevent financial meltdowns. <laughs> uh, so, and their and their fraud claims. So they they have specific rules. And in '95 they passed this PSLRA, and that was meant to try to bring, if you will, tort reform to these type types of cases. Okay, and it was aimed squarely at 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 some of the pleading standards and uh, who could be a plaintiff. You're going to hear these themes over and over. And and what, what the plaintiffs had to plead in their initial complaints, okay? So that law got passed. And, and, and I would say that the primary function of that, of that law was to try to get institutional investors involved in cases, right? So you see a lot of case law now that's brought by the 
California Teachers Fund or the New York State Teachers Retirement Fund. Or, and there was a thought that, you know, there was, there was this uh, professional plaintiff problem. So the law was passed to try to get institutional investors in. The cases have still been brought and they continue to trundle along. And what happened was that the big firms got employed by the institutional investors and the cases kept going. All right, fast forward 10 years. It's 2005, now I've been in St. Louis for five years, and there's another Republican Congress that wants to pass more tort reform. So they passed something called the Class Action Fairness Act, CAFA. Now, I personally felt like at that moment, that law was aimed at Madison County. Anybody been to Madison County? I think you probably have, right? Okay, and the quote unquote judicial hellholes. What that law did, amongst other things, primarily was to take a lot of state court litigation and put it in the federal court. And, and I think that was kind of one of the, the ethos of the law was we, don't, we think what's happening to uh, defendants, mostly corporate, in state courts across the country is unfair, so we're going to move that litigation into federal court. So a lot of cases that normally would have been litigated in MADCO and St. Clair and St. Louis City and St. Louis County started to get litigated in federal court, and federal judges had to deal with a lot more consumer fraud and types of cases that were being litigated in state court before that. Um, okay. 2005 passes, and CAFA, you know, CAFA got passed, but you can still bring a case in state court. It's just that you have to have only, you have to have plaintiffs and defendants from that state on behalf of a class in that state only, right? And it's very tough to keep it there because it has to be below a certain threshold. However, um, you know, you can still do it. So the thing I wanted to talk about a little bit today, a little bit more, is that there's another tort reform effort in the wind. It's sitting, actually, it was just passed by the House, and uh, because there's another Republican Congress, you may have heard, we have a Republican president, and, uh, and the guy from Virginia, the, the legislator, not the guy, the legislator from Virginia who was, whose, whose law it was that was passed in 05, the CAFA Act, Class Action Fairness Act, passed this bill, and it's called the Fairness in Class Action Litigation Act. It's, there's a summary of it, in, in it's a handout. The way I would address or, or talk to you about this, and just so you understand it, because it hasn't been passed, it may not make it to the Senate, it might get filibustered. President Donald Trump has some other legislative priorities that he may put ahead of this. But with a Republican Congress and a Republican president, it may be that this will get passed. Okay, and I put two things in the, in the handouts for you to look at and consider. The law itself, and we're going to talk about some of these other aspects of class actions, but what I would say is that since 2005 and the passage of the Class Action Fairness Act and today, April 27th of 2017, there has been debates about particular aspects of class actions. What has to be pled? What's the pleading standard? What, how, how is the class defined and how, how should the class be defined and how should a court judge how the class is defined? What, what should the plaintiff's lawyers, if they achieve a settlement, have to say to the public about how many claims were made or what was paid out? When should the plaintiff's lawyers be paid if they are successful in achieving a, a class action settlement or judgment? And there's been, there has been case law about this. Some of this is sort of, in my view, politically driven, but some of it's just different case law over time. And what has happened is that this law, this Fairness Act, the Fairness, in, it's a really weird one, Fairness in Class Action Litigation Act, the FICALA, I guess we'll call it, uh, is, and, it, and it seeks to do a number of things. You'll see them there. I've, I've put what I think they're aiming at in my bracketed notes, okay? Or I somewhat I know they're aiming at. Um, the, the one of the things I want to talk to you about is uh, sort of coming into this is uh, it's a, something called ascertainability. Has anybody ever heard that word in any context whatsoever? <laughs> no, I'm guessing no. Ascertainable. Okay, ascertainability is a class action thing. 
when you define your class, and this is one of the first things you have to do in a class action, figure out who you're going to represent, right? You've got a plaintiff. They were injured. We'll talk a little bit more about that. How do you identify that? But you've, you've figured out you have someone, you think they're injured, you think that multiple people, maybe millions of people were injured in the same way, and you think a class action will work. Now you're going to define the class. There has been a whole body of case law as, as courts try to make a decision about whether your class action should be certified, right? And that's a big step because that's a due process thing. And if, 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 if due process matters, then once I certify the class, whatever happens, to every, whatever happens in the rest of this case is going to redound to everybody that I defined in that class. Okay? So if, if, I get, if you get summary judgment against you, everybody's out. If we win that trial, everybody's in, right? So the, there's been a lot of case law when judges are trying to determine, uh, you, is your, oh, sorry, go ahead. Not having a background in yeah. this area. Uh, what about like opt-in or opt-out? Yeah, those, those types of things uh, are basically traceable to the particular law. So for example, in a, in a, a Fair Labor Standards Act type case, you can have, and sometimes in employment situations, you can have an opt-in versus an opt-out class. Um, basically, opt-in type classes based on the particular law means just what it says. Anybody who becomes, has, you have to affirmatively state that you want to be into the class. 23B3 type classes, damages classes, known as an opt-out class, means you're in unless you affirmatively say you want out. And that comes at the notice stage. So, you know, again, it depends kind of on the case law or the particular law that you're suing under. But the, uh, the opt-in and opt-out is just that. You have to affirmatively do one of the, if you're an opt-in class and that's what the law requires, you've got to affirmatively state, I want to be a part of that class. Opt-out is, is the other way. So, a little bit more just about ascertainability. Ascertainability is not in Rule 23. Rule 23, which was passed in, in 1966, and all this case law that I'm going to talk about is sort of flown from there, it's not in the rule. But a number of courts have read into this law or this rule that it is implied. And there's become a, a, a spectrum of law, okay? There's the very strict standard by the Third Circuit. There's a split of the circuits right now. The Third Circuit and a couple of other circuits are very strict, and they say that your class has to be defined by objective standards, right? That's number one. But also, there has to be a way, uh, a literal way to be able to determine through evidence that someone can identify whether they are actually in the class. Okay, so how does that play out? I've, I've given you, I've just handed out to everybody. Is any, nobody, anybody here from the Driscoll firm? Dowd and Dowd? Anybody know those guys? Okay, you know those guys. Yeah, so this case I handed you, this in Ray morning song bird food litigation, <laughs> they are the lead counsel in that, okay? I'm not going to, I, I invite you to read it, but there is a long section of that um, case that talks about uh, whether a particular, uh, thank you, whether a particular class uh, should be certified, and it talks about whether the, the class is ascertainable. Can you, can the judge figure out, can the parties figure out a way to, to determine who is in and who's out of the class? And I'll just give you some of the arguments that go on both sides. Defendants often say, hey, listen, I don't sell my products to consumers. And frankly, I don't keep lists of who buys it. I sell my products to third parties. They sell it to stores. And I don't, you know, I don't know who has it. I don't have those lists. You, I don't have documents to tell you. So, you know, you're not going to get this, this, this class isn't ascertainable. Plaintiffs, on the other hand, and it was true in this case, say things like, well, I have subpoena power over the third party retailers you sell to. I'm going to subpoena 
everybody's customer list and I'm going to cobble together everybody who they have sold it to and someone in, in these circumstances can also file an affidavit under penalty of perjury that they were in the class. And in those two ways, the class can be ascertainable. In this particular um, case, the Songbird case, the judge in the Southern District of California said, I agree with the plaintiffs. The, the, the plaintiffs here can show who was in the class. They can get lists from the third party retailers. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we will figure out, we'll be able to figure out who's in and who's out. So I'm going to certify the class. And this was certified on March 31st of this year. So, you know, these things are continuing to be debated. All right. So um, you've got, you've got, you can look through what the, what the class action, the latest tort reform effort looks like. There's a Forbes article in there. You don't want to be sensitive to the defense lawyers. And uh, I guess Gary always looked at you, so I'm going to say defense lawyers. But uh, the, uh, the, def the cha U.S. Chamber of Commerce and folks who are interested in tort reform have a view on what this bill means. And the Forbes article tells you, I think, the, the opposite view of mine, of why these bills are important. I just want to... <laughs> I just want to point out one thing. Um, in the ascertainability section, it says, it also assumes the goal of deterrence outweighs the cost of litigation. Both are debatable at best. If a company's behavior is egregious enough, regulators and state attorneys general can and do deliver deterrence. Okay, well, that's one view. <laughs> uh, I happen to, and I've been doing this a long time, and I happen to think of myself, and I think if you'll look at a lot of um, uh, sort of the underpinnings of Rule 23, the concept was, and they, they weren't, this wasn't, this wasn't like hidden, the concept was to incentivize lawyers like myself and others to, to become essentially private attorneys general, to, to try to root out fraud and deception and misrepresentation with a with a profit motive at the bottom line it, there was no there was no hidden agenda at the time this was passed and over the time i think you know there's been different views on whether that was uh whether rule 23 as written and as as, as put into practice can continue to to operate that way i only give you one other thing on ascertainability but it's really good because it has a great discussion of um of uh what ascertainability means and what Rule 23 means, if I can find it. If I didn't put it aside, one, stop, one spot, one second. Ah, oh, here it is. This is for the real eggheads in the crowd. I'm one of them. Sorry. So if you really care about Rule 23 and what it means and why it was passed and how all these issues affect you, if you're going to bring one of these cases, there's a Yale Law Journal article from 2015, May of 2015, Volume 124, 2000, uh, number seven, May 2015, it's called Class Ascertainability by Jeffrey Shaw of the Yale Law Journal. And it's, it's a great, it's written from the perspective of me and we, the plaintiff's lawyers, so it's got that bent to it. But I, uh, I love the, the historical background it gives on Rule 23, and I invite you to look at that. Why was Rule 23 passed? You know, what, what does it mean for, uh, for why class actions matter, frankly? Okay, so uh, turning to cases themselves. Um, and I know that you've talked about, uh, tell me again the kind that sort of. Oh, it's, it's more than that, but we've done fr franchise cases of, with uh, franchisees who read the contract. Yeah. Uh, the Curves case that just, or that just came down, I don't know if you saw that or not, it was a jury verdict last week. Right. My co-counsel got that. Uh, we, we had one against another place called Contours. I've also been involved in the Hurry uh, Mesh stuff. Sure, you know, sure. And, yeah, so these... And I'll just tell you, I hate them yells. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people uh, would say I think, that. I think uh, class actions are very useful. Yeah. So, uh, so the first thing I want to say, and, and the reason I just handed you this, this sort of 
uh, expanded. It's a it's an expanded outline of what's in the materials. <laughs> and the reason I wanted to give it to you was, if you turn to the second page, this case origination page. This is what I just handed you. I just handed you. It's got my my name up the top. And there's this. this if you you should be looking at the Discover bank card payment. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. See that? There's like three bullets under that. The three bullets under there are uh, what happened at the settlement. But I want to talk to you about how that case started, at least for me, okay? I have a colleague who has a Discover card, a former colleague, and uh, she walks into my office one day and she goes, I had the strangest phone call. I cannot believe it. I, I got this Discover card and I got my bill and I'm looking at it, and there's this charge on here for this thing called this payment protection plan. Have you ever heard of it? I said, I didn't, I didn't ask for that. I never paid for that. I never authorized you to charge me for that. <laughs> and she goes, and the, and the person on the other end of the phone was deliberately obfuscating what had happened. They were, you know, it was very clear to her that the person she was talking to was reading from a script and was not telling her why this charge showed up on her bill, okay? That turned into a $10.5 million class action settlement, of which we were one of many firms that were litigating it. My point is that I think a lot of people think that class actions like are some of this funky animal that show up out of, you know, out of the, you know, I don't know where they think they come from, but, you know, I, I, I mean this when I say, Look around your house. <laughs> Do you have a product that you think fails miserably more often than it should, and you paid a hefty sum for it? Have you run into interference about your ability to get refunds for that or to get it repaired? You may be looking at a really, really good and important class action. Okay, the person, the Beth Kleitch, who has an IKEA oven, in Chicago, at her place in Chicago, couldn't get the self-clean function to work. Every time she, when she ran it, it shut her oven down. And she wanted to know why that was the true. And it turns out that Kathy Cates in South Carolina with the same type of oven from 2004 had the same problem, even though she had had the oven for a little while. So I, I, I really mean that. These class action ideas come from your own experience. They come from your colleagues' experience. Uh, yes, sometimes they come from somebody who's out there surfing the net, looking at blogs, you know, consumerproductsucks.com or whatever they're looking at. I don't, you know, I don't know. And sometimes, sometimes they come from somebody who's thinking deeply about a particular issue, like, uh, you know, a particular, a particular securities that is being sold in a way that's deceptive or fraudulent. And they've thought about it and they've been deeply immersed in it. And that becomes a case. But I honestly mean, look around, talk to your colleagues, read, surf the net. You may have the idea for the next big class action. You just haven't really thought of it that way. Yes, question. So I've been approached sporadically on identical issues on multiple plaintiffs. Um, it's a construction issue. And uh, so my question is, what's your experience with when uh, a customer, a consumer, receives something called a lifetime warranty. What does lifetime mean, you know, you know, in the life of a house or a car or, you know, or other product? That's a, that's a fantastic question. You may have a really good case. When did the product fail upon its purchase? I mean, these are, hey, I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, let, I, this, you can talk as much or as little about it as you want. Here's what I would say to you. We, uh, I, when I first moved to St. Louis, um, I was asked by a former colleague to get involved in a case involving something called Entran 2. Okay, Entran 2 is a product. It's a it's a hose that goes into the floors of of homes, usually high end homes, for something called radiant heating. Some of you may have radiant heating in your home or your vacation home, and if you do, that's awesome because it makes the floors warm. Entran 2 was a tube that was made by Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. And, and, and those floors had a particular warrant, those, those, the Entran system 
had a warranty life. And so, you know, those questions, that question, what does a lifetime warranty mean? When should a, when is it reasonable for a product to fail? Or, or is there a time when should it last? How long is a lifetime? These are questions that the court's going to have to wrestle with in the context of breach of express warranty, breach of implied warranty of merchantability, the claims that you brought. But those claims about the Entran 2 tubing and the fact that it failed uh, led first in the Entran 2 case to a $300 million settlement. I'm going to talk about that later against Goodyear for homes all over America mostly in places like Taos, New Mexico, and really, really nice resort homes in high, in, at high elevations who want warm floors during the winter, but can also be used for snow melt in driveways. So, you know, the, I think the thing to be thinking about is these uh, are these other steps that I would talk to you about. You know, do, is there a viable defendant? Do you have strong liability? Is, is, there, is, there some, is there some indication that the product, whatever it is, is, is failing before its natural life? Now, if they've warranted it for a lifetime and it's failed after 15 years, that's probably a case I'm going to take a hard look at. My firm has done a ton of product defect cases, including failing shingles. Um, we're currently litigating against IKO in the Central District of, of Illinois. Okay, we uh, settled a massive case against certainty uh, for shingles. We've also done cases involving plumbing products. Uh, there was a case involving Kitech plumbing products in, a ho in houses all over America. That was a $25 million all cash settlement in Dallas, Texas. So, you know, you have a series of questions that you need to ask, I think, to sort of decide is that a case? Um, and some of the things that you do when you start to dig into this, uh, you know, I put research, 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 and that's what it is. You know, when we go out and we're looking at a consumer fraud type claim, um, one of the cases we have right now is a case against um, uh, Jessica Alba's company, Honest Company, who put, and this, there's this whole series of cases like this. It's about false labeling. You know, they sell you a product that says it's all natural. And it's not. Mostly because of you, my wife stopped using that. <laughs> <laughs> no, was it the sun? Was it the well, sunscreen? She was all about it because we just had, you know, baby, ten months old, and she's like, "Oh, this is the greatest product, blah blah." And she's like, "Oh, I just read a class action against them. They're using something they're not supposed to. You're not using this anymore." Yeah, sorry about that. I apologize for the disruption of your family life. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the kind of thing, uh, you know. And, you know, I get we can have lots of debates about whether, you know, that but ultimately it comes down to, for me, listen, we're holding people accountable for what they say in the marketplace. And that's true whether you said it about a stock or your company, whether you warranted a product. If you said something and it turns out that that thing you said wasn't true, we may come after you about that. So... Uh, Okay, a little bit about, um, just a little bit about client, you know, sometimes the biggest hurdle in these cases is, is being retained by a client who actually had the problem. Now, in the situation of my colleague who had the phone call with Discover, that was right, she was on to an idea, but, you know, she couldn't be the plaintiff. So, this brings into concepts of lawyer advertising and... Um, solicitation issues if you know it's okay for you to talk to your friends that's not solicitation you can talk to people you know about this case idea and did that happen to them um, that's not solicitation and you know you need to know what those rules are because one of the things that's going to happen at the in all likelihood in discovery almost certainly is your clients going to get deposed and the defense lawyer is going to ask, so when did you first figure out that you were going to sue? Did you call Mr. Flannery or did Mr. Flannery call you? 
Question. There's nothing wrong with investigating a claim and then finding other witnesses or potential people for the investigation that's not solicitation. Correct. Absolutely right. So you need to know that you need to know the rules. And one other thing, when you're if you find somebody who had the problem and uh, and they want to proceed with the case, and usually that involves a, a long conversation about what's that mean? And I've had a lot of these conversations. So if you have a class case or you think you have one and you want somebody to be the plaintiff and you've you've talked to them or they called you out of the blue and said, what's the problem with this? You're going to have to have that conversation about what happens. And the answer is that they need they do need to do a number of things. You will do everything in your power to make it as least onerous as possible. But they're going to have to do some things. They're going to have to keep their documents. Yes. There's a Missouri State case, I haven't read it for a while, but there's a Missouri State case that says that the defense lawyer can't ask these questions. They can't ask you when did you hire your lawyer, you know, what did he tell you. It, it, it's a, it's attorney-client privilege and it's not relevant to when you, you know, they, they, they would like to make a point that, oh, well, you didn't even sue, you, you didn't even think about making a claim until after you talked to this lawyer. I can, no, that's going to be this But, I mean, it may be different in federal court. I don't know. Yeah, I... <laughs> I'm, I'm not familiar with that case specifically, but I will say that in those moments of depositions, I'm really hard on the, uh, well, first of all, I should step back. When I'm prepping my client, I'm very clear about where the attorney-client privilege lies, when it starts. And in federal court, you know, but also in state court, it's usually, well, they get to know that we talk. They don't get to know what we talked about. They, they get to know how long we spent together. They don't get to know all the things that we talked about during that time. Right. And, you, you know, so you have to talk to your client. You have to get them ready. You're going to tell them about the deposition. You're going to tell them about keeping their documents. You're going you're gonna to write to them and say, preserve the documents that relate to this case. Don't destroy anything. And you're going to get them ready for the basics of discovery. And you're going to tell them that you will stay in touch with them and that they will be involved in the context, the context of the settlement, whether it happens or not, and they'll be kept informed. But essentially, once they've given their deposition and their documents, for a large part of the case, they're done. You know, you're, run, you're, you're litigating the case, you're writing the briefs, you're dealing with the hearings, you're dealing with the judge. They may need to come back in at particular times, uh, but th it's that discovery piece that they need to understand. Um, okay, a little bit about um, the complaints. Um, can I, I just, can, yeah. That may be relevant on statute issues. I don't think it's relevant in any other way, solicitation, on the, on the contact and stuff. And they can only get, I think, the time of the meeting and the subject matter of representation. I think that's where a lot of the cases come down. Yeah, and I my, my sense is, in, in almost, I've, it's been rare in my experience where I've, okay, this isn't, maybe this comes off as pejorative. I've seen younger lawyers try to make this thing happen. And most of the time, most of the time, judges are like, you know, this just is going nowhere. I mean, this is going nowhere. You know, they came, they came into contact with each other. Um, so, you know, but you're going to face it. Right? I, I haven't seen it. I've rarely seen it succeed. I can only think of one case where someone turned the question of whether how the plaintiff came into contact with the lawyer became a thing that the judge ever cared about. And it was it was once, it was sort of special circumstances. Um, okay, so you have a case, you have a client, you're ready to go. Now you gotta write the complaint. Okay, this is uh, this is really important. Not that, not just, I know that's really obvious, but in class actions, figuring out where you're gonna file, what's the jurisdiction, um, and, you know, little things. I put in your, uh, this has just come up recently, but in a couple of our complaints, we wrote in, the, in, in identifying the parties and the plaintiff, we said sentences like, John Smith is a resident of Marion County, Illinois. And in that wise good case that I gave you, that order, the magistrate saw our complaint five days later and he said, order to show cause why you shouldn't be kicked out on jurisdictional grounds. <laughs> why? Because residence is not citizenship. 
And the Seventh Circuit has become really hot on this. So we had to file an amended complaint which said John Smith is a citizen of X County, Illinois. Um, and so diversity of citizenship applies, not just residents. So you got to be careful. Obviously, the words matter. Um, the um, You need to be thinking about, do I want to be in federal court or state court? Do I even have an option to be in state court? You know, everybody's on PACER now. It's hard to keep your case below the radar. It used to be back in the day. I can I say this. Have I gotten, I've gotten older. In the old days, uh, you, you, you could keep your case below the radar by being in state court, right? They didn't, there was times where you could file your case and nobody knew that you were litigating this massive class action. That may have led to CAFA, it's possible. But, um, <laughs> but you could do that. Now, virtually all these class cases end up in federal court. Everybody's on PACER, so, I mean, plaintiff's lawyers and companies, defense lawyers, are out there, who got sued today? You know, run the search in PACER, all courts. I mean, you can do it. So you need to, as you are crafting your complaint, you, should, you need to be thinking, okay, are there other cases out there? Obviously, this is some of the research you already did, but if they're out there, where should I file? And obviously, I'm zealously representing my client, so I want to win for them. But I'm filing it as a class case, so I already have, in my view, you already have, by saying it's a class case, you have a fiduciary obligation to the absent class members. This is, a, this, is a, this is somewhat controversial at times. It'll come up when the defendant wants to bring in 15 or 20 absent class members and take discovery of them, or they want to send communications to them, and he'll say, I don't think you can necessarily communicate with my people in my class that way. Um, so you need to be thinking about where should I file this case? Should it be in state or federal court? Um, obviously, the substantive facts matter. And you're all in, again, I'm mostly in federal court. I, I you know, it's a, there's, I'm sure there's a similar standard. I don't know if it's got the, in, in federal court, we now have the Twombly and Iqbal standards, which replaced sort of the notice pleading standards, which had been around forever. <clears throat> And, and Twombly, I got the standard in there for you, the Twombly and Iqbal standard really becomes down to your facts need to, quote, plausibly give rise to an entitlement to relief, unquote. So plausibility is in the hands of the judge on the motion to dismiss. So again, this has led to really intensely researched and factually driven uh, counts. I, I had one more so old war story. Used to be like in antitrust cases, I mean, the bare bones nature of those cases, like defendants colluded, it was illegal, they're guilty. I mean, this, I, 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 when I first started, that's a gross overstatement, but there were, there were the, the, the notice pleading has really gone crazy. So now you see, you know, this is, leads to 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 page complaints right out of the gate. And that's in because you don't want to get dismissed on Twombly and Iqbal. Except, and I've seen it on both sides of the state, at least in the district courts, that Iqbal Twombly is not necessarily held to the same standard for affirmative defenses as it is for the, for the complaints. Whereas district court judges will, um, some will strike bare bones affirmative defenses or legal conclusions and other judges treat it like it is um, the gold standard and, and will uphold and will not uh, uh, issue uh, motions to strike affirmative defenses and hold them to the same standard as a Baltimore. Is that your? Yeah, it's a fair point. I, I have seen cases on both sides where, you know, and I think what you're talking, what's being talked about here is the defendant coming in and answering yeah which is like bare bones with like affirmative not not factual support right. as is held to the same standard underneath right as, as a complaint yeah um, and and you know as my my practical experience is that i don't really even try to litigate that because i'm feeling like making my judge think about all those things focuses him in on <laughs> 
all the things I don't want to lose on. All right. Well, affirmative defense 23 isn't pled well, but man, those other affirmative defenses are awesome. Right? So, um, okay. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about, um, well, I put in a couple uh, contexts of cases that I've litigated. Uh, the Mercury Marine case was up in Illinois that had to do with defective motors on the backs of boats. Yes. Uh, I want to ask you, kind of a, well, getting back, you, you mentioned, hey, I'm going to go look on PACER and see who's filing what. Yeah. Um, is there some area of PACER that gives you open access to other uh, kind of file materials? Let's say I want to, I want to go and you know, somebody approached me on another issue, and I want to go to X states. Eastern District uh, case. I want to see the pleadings. Yes. Are you talking about like so you you want to go to the Middle District of Tennessee's case and you want to look at the pleadings? Yes. Yeah, how close is this issue to what does my client has approached me? On? Yeah. You. Yeah. I mean, I within reason. I mean, it's not always true. It's not always true, but almost all of the pleadings Should you can be. click on and you can pull them up in PDF and. It's, you know, it's not under seal. It's not under seal. You can get that. It should, it should be able to. Should be able to, yeah. Almost always. Um, so, yeah. You, and, and, and that's one of the things you need to do. You need to be going around looking at where, where who is already out there. I mean, I've had a lot of cases come up where I'm like, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> man, this well, is... Go I ahead. Did a, you know, I did a Google search on the issue. And, oh, well, there's an interesting case from, you know, that's on file. Yeah. Um, filed you know, 2015. Is this? How do I know if this is the same issue? Yeah, you have to. You, I think what what he's asking about is, you've got to drill down a little bit into the actual pleadings of what was pled, what were they going after? Because, because, and I, you know, point of my story is I've had a lot of great case ideas come in on cases that were already settled. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, this is an awesome case. Yeah. It got settled in 2004. Yeah. I mean, it's awful. <laughs> you know, so yeah, you need to go drill down and get that material figured out. Um, okay, a couple things on the class definition. You know, it goes back to the ascertainability part, but you know, almost all class definitions that I've seen that are well written usually have a date. To, I mean, it's it's in my view somewhat rare to say that it's everything that was always purchased. That's rare. Usually, there's a date, you know, identifier about when the misconduct occurred. Um, you need to decide: uh, Are you going to try nationwide or multi-state or one state only? These are strategic questions. They they interplay with what's coming next, and that's the class certification decision. Am I, am, I, am I going to be able, for example, and I had to make this decision and it, it's on, it's, it's in front of Judge St. Eve as we speak, we had to decide what cases, should, what classes should we bring when we try to seek certification of the Ovens case. And we went with a nationwide, and it, it, and it relates to your claims too, it's nationwide for implied warranty or nationwide for express warranty or in the alternative, Your Honor, if you don't think we have sufficient evidence to get the nationwide certification, how about Illinois only? And only for the IKEA ovens, right? So I've given her a plausible subset that she could certify if she's not inclined to certify the broader class. You need to think about those things up front. Um, yes? Quick question about that. Do you, is it your practice to, to give them multiple options straight off the bat or do you go for one? That's a great question, John. And I, uh, my answer is that I am inclined to be broader at the start, but when I get to the class, the actual filing of the class motion, I oftentimes modify my original class. And here's why, this isn't gonna be a surprise, but I've usually taken discovery in that time frame. And I've probably determined that, you know, I may have an idea that I, I was overbroad when I started, because that's not what the evidence shows. 
and you're going to find out in the class certification decision context that the judge who now because of a number of recent decisions is it's absolutely mandatory that they take a look behind the pleadings they don't just look at the you know they're looking at the evidence they're doing a rigorous examination of what your case looks like because they're looking ahead to the trial they have to do that at the class certification stage right so so to answer your question sometimes I modify oftentimes I modify it so my class motion may not may not be exactly what I pled in the original complaint. It may seek certification of different classes. That's possible. Um, and uh, just a little bit about organization of counsel. Someone said they hate MDLs. Uh, I understand why. <laughs> but it's a part of what we do in the class, in the class context on the federal level. Um, it's true in bigger states. I, I don't think there's a... a uh, an equivalent in Missouri, although there is one in California where I practiced for a while called the JCCP, which is basically the MDL for California state cases. California gets a lot of class action. It's not surprising. Big state, pretty favorable law. So they have their own mini MDL. The federal MDL, in case, okay, let me make sure everybody understands it. MDL is multi district litigation, right? Uh, the JPML is the Judicial Panel on Multi-District Litigation. It's a, it's a separately created body. There are separate rules for it. Uh, you can search it on PACER. It's now all electronic. Um, it's, got its own, it's got its own courthouse in the Thurgood Marshall Building right off of Union Station, right next to the Capitol. Um, and the MDL, which really rose, arose out of all the asbestos cases in an attempt to the federal courts to get their arms around that, the MDL is a 10-judge uh, panel whose sole job every two months is to get together and decide if there's a way to take multiple cases from around the country and push them into one, into one court for pre-trial, only pre-trial stuff. And the way I know that pre-trial is really important is that the lexicon case. Anybody know who the, what the lexicon case is? Okay, lexicon involved my San Diego firm, um, and what it meant was that uh, the lexicon principle stands for the concept that wherever your case originated, if you get sent to an MDL, that's pretrial only. When the trial happens, it has to happen back in the court you filed it in. So if you filed in the Eastern District of Missouri and you get MDL to the District of Massachusetts, when that judge is done with all the pretrial stuff, your trial is supposed to happen in the District of Missouri, Eastern District of Missouri, okay? And the way that that came about was that uh, our, our firm, Milberg Weiss, sued, it was the Lincoln Financial cases, and they sued the expert who had worked with Charles, what's his name? Come on, Lincoln. I can't think of his last name. He was the main defendant. Keating. Made huge fraud. Keating? It wasn't Keating. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so. Different guy, I think. But he was the main defendant, and we sued the expert. The expert actually uh, settled out of that case and then uh, went back to their home jurisdiction and sued for wrongful prosecution in the, in the district of... of uh, the Northern District of Illinois. So the expert settles out of the case, goes back to Northern District of Illinois, sues for uh, wrongful prosecution, gets pulled back in the MDL, and then uh, ultimately that court where the MDL was uh, ruled that it went, it went to trial there. And they said, well, that's not right. We shouldn't be trying here. We filed our case for wrongful prosecution back in the Eastern Northern District of Illinois. Long story short, they took that all the way to the Supreme Court, and in the lexicon case, the Supreme Court said, yeah, the trial should have been in the Northern District of Illinois, and then it went back there, and they tried the case against my firm, and the, uh, okay, it's true, the, uh, the compensatory damages upon the jury verdict were uh, $50 million. And the next day, they were gonna come back with punies. So the guys in my firm chose to settle at that point rather than hear the jury verdict 
about punitive damages. <laughs> Which was interesting, um, as a young associate at that firm, <laughs> who was watching from afar. I had nothing to do with that case. Um, but the lexicon case, uh, you know, so you need to know, you file in a particular district, you're, you're going to end up trying it there. Um, MDLs, really briefly, you know, when I file a case, this is usually a strategic decision. I file a case, I know that there's cases in Florida and Texas and Oregon, and, you know, let's just say what it is. I want to control that case. I feel like I want to run it. I want to be the lead counsel. So I'm going to file a motion in the MDL. I'm going to get there first. I'm going to be the guy who's talking to the MDL judges at the panel hearing six months after I filed it. And if and ultimately, if the judge says, yeah, it goes to your court, then you're probably in a good position. If it doesn't go to your court, you may not be lead counsel. You may be, it may be, you know, you may be uh, waiting to get any work in that case. You may not get any work. Um, but organization of counsel, it's, it's um, you know, you have to negotiate. It's negotiation. It's choosing to work with particular firms. And it's all those basic concepts of how do I do work with that other firm? Um, and sometimes you compete and you get in front of the judge and you say, I should be lead, and the other person says he should be lead, and the judge just picks. So MDLs, have it's, it's a procedural mechanism to get cases together and get them litigated efficiently. So class certification. You're not dressed well enough. I know. i got to work this afternoon, too. Right. I think most of you know the... Uh, uh, the standards that apply at the class certification stage. That's why I wanted to give you this broader outline. I mean, you need to know, you need to be focusing on numerosity, commonality, typicality, adequacy, predominance, and superiority. You got to win those uh, if you're going to get your class filed or your class certified. 23C4 individual issue certification has become quite hot. Um, it's if you look back in the in the new tort reform law, they're trying to get rid of that or they're trying to make that harder because one of the ways, and I did it, one of the ways to get a certification is to say to the judge, well, I can't get the full damages class certified, but at least certify the liability question. Let me try that. Okay, and that's, uh, that's another way to get your class certified. Uh, trial, um, you know, these cases rarely go to trial, but when they do, um, it's it's a uh, it's a whole lot of work. Um, you've you've got to marshal a ton of witnesses and a ton of evidence, and uh, you know, for obvious reasons, perhaps defendants don't often do it. It's usually bet the company types of money, so they don't do it. Uh, huge incentives not to, but they do. And when they do, you got a you got a load of work on your hands. Um, settlement, preliminary approval, final approval. If you're lucky enough to litigate well enough to get a settlement, uh, your work is not done by a long ways. And you're going to have to craft a settlement agreement. But at that point, you are linked arms, usually with the defendant, and you're working in tandem f with the people that you were just really fighting very, very hard against. And you are now working against, usually, objectors and other people who don't want your settlement to succeed. Um, you need to be cognizant of uh, what the standards are for the settlement in the, case, in, the, in the court you're in, and you need to tailor your pleadings for that. Um, and, uh, and then the last thing I'll just say about claims administration is that even when you've settled, even when the judge signs the, rule, signs the, the, the order and fills in the amount of the attorney's fees that are awarded, there's still claims administration. You are still going to be talking to people who have this problem because they don't know how to get through to the claims administrator and they need help, and you still have a fiduciary obligation to them, so you still got to help them. Class actions. One -on -one. Go. <laughs> if you guys have other class actions or ideas and stuff, Mike's card is here. You can ask me, you can ask Mike. Uh, he's, he's, he's out of D.C., but, he, but he's, got, he's got a St. Louis office, too. So, uh, and these, you know, these, as he said, these ideas, you can run with them. And, and you know, like every other plan case, you got to jump through so many hoops. If you fail at one, you fail at the whole thing. So thanks, Mike.